Amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated again. Uh, good morning. Welcome. We're so glad all of you are here. If I haven't met you yet, my name's Blake, and I'm the teaching pastor here at this church. And so we are so thankful that you are joining us. And we have just a few uh, quick uh, uh, updates for you guys before we dive into God's Word together. Uh, first off, again, like Pastor Breck said, if you are new, please take a quick moment to fill out that Connect With Us sheet. Uh, I personally call those, but then also uh, those first-time guests, but also we give uh, to a local ministry in your honor. And so uh, be, please be so kind to us as to fill that sheet out. We would love to hear who you are and how we can connect you further. And also, you, uh, you who have, are not new, you know that those sheets are the way that we pray for you guys. And so make sure uh, to fill those out to let us know how we can pray for you. And I want to invite you, uh, if uh, you are new, if you're not new, uh, to grab your phones, go to Facebook, hop over to the Central Baptist Paragold app, or excuse me, not the Central Baptist Paragold app, but the page, and then share this service right now. It's been really crazy to see what God does as we take a quick moment to share this service. And again, we're not sharing us, we're not sharing me. What we're ultimately wanting to share is Christ. And so take a quick moment to uh, do that. Uh, that would be awesome. But then also, uh, I want to, uh, just kind of on a personal note, I want to say thank you uh, to this church. Uh, you guys have been so faithful and resilient uh, just in this past season of us kind of going all over the place and meeting different places, meeting online, Jonesboro here, now back to uh, uh, B.C. Lloyd here in, uh, next week. You guys have been so awesome, and it's so easy now these days to, to, to be what I call or to fall into easy Christianity where if you don't like something and if something's difficult or hard or you have to be flexible on something you just bail out and go somewhere else but I love and want to just champion and, and, and encourage and say how grateful I am to you as a church that's not you you guys have continued to stay faithful to stay with us to stay the course and so I just want to say thank you guys it's an honor to to pastor and, and to do this with you guys and uh, so a part of your faithfulness and a part of your resiliency as a church in the midst of a pandemic that we've walked through and, and uh, land that we've bought, all these things is, as you guys have continued whoop, to be faithful in the Build on Bethel project that we are in uh, to, to build uh, a church there at the corner of Highway 49 and 69, a church building. And uh, so I wanted to give you guys an update really quickly on the Build on Bethel project, what's happening, what's new, and then we're going to dive into God's Word together. But uh, first off, I want to say, many of you may have saw this this last week, but sewer and utilities are being run to the property as we speak. So those things are, those things are cut, and that was one of the speed bumps that we had, and so that is happening. And so that's a huge next step for us, and so we're excited about that. Uh, but also, uh, you guys, as of today... Uh, have faithfully given $800,336 since October towards that. And so, man, I just want to celebrate that, that you guys have uh, have stayed the course and continued to give. And to be honest, in the midst of crazy gas prices and a lot of other things that are going on economically that make it really difficult for us to keep being faithful when it's kind of pressing in on our budgets. But I just want to celebrate and highlight the fact that we as a church are still being faithful in that. And then also, uh, we're excited that we have <clears throat> also launched a Build on Bethel team made up of uh, not only staff members from Jonesboro, staff members from Central uh, Paragold, but also uh, Paragold campus members. So that'll be launched here in the next couple of weeks. But there is a team uh, that has been assembled together to communicate the updates. So after this major thing that's happening with utilities is moving forward, there's going to be a lot of things that are happening, and so we want to create this team to kind of be a sounding board for you guys to know what is happening, what's going on with the building, because you have a right to know. I've heard so many of you say, hey, I don't want to talk to you about it because I know you're busy and you got a lot going on, uh, but you have a right to know what's happening with the building. And so we created this team for communication, but then also to help us move the ball forward. And so we're excited about that, made up of Paragold members, and uh, so super excited about those next steps. And I just want to say to you guys, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. So I want to pray for us, and then we're going to dive into God's Word together. But let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for your Word. We thank you for the land and the property, God, and, and uh, Lord, what you're doing out there and moving the ball forward. Father, I pray that we would move into that building and that, God, that we would be a launching pad to the nations and our neighbors from that place. That, God, our children, our, our students would be discipled in that place. A part of discipleship would take place there. God, that we would see thousands upon thousands of people gather, but also, even more than that, 
and be sent out from there to the ends of the earth. Uh, Lord, continue to do immeasurably more and bless today, Father. Bless today. God, so many people this morning do not need to hear from me. They need to hear from you. And so, God, may that be this morning. And, Father, we do thank you for the country that you placed us in, the freedoms that we have. We rejoice in that. We celebrate that tomorrow. And, uh, God, we are grateful for what you're doing. And I pray, uh, God, all these things now in the awesome name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God sought you. In the depths of your lostness, God showed up. Found you. Rescued you. Forgave you. Redeemed you and freed you forever. He stepped in and rerouted the trajectory of your life. Ensuring a hope and a peace that lasts from the brightest of days through the darkest of nights. Until the shores of the great forever. Welcome back. So again, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Romans chapter 6. That's where we'll be. If you don't have your Bible, the passage will be here on the screen, and it's also there in your notes, which we are going to be using those notes today, so I would encourage you to grab some. If you haven't already, uh, grab those there in the back. Uh, But as we are turning there, as we are looking at this idea from Romans chapter 6 of who are we going to be servants of, who are we going to follow, and Paul's going to unpack this here in just a moment, but I want to bring your attention first to a article that I read recently that was both sad and fascinating. Sad and, and interesting, the, the, um, the sociological understanding of this specific instance. So we all know that on January 1st, 1863, Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. And in the Emancipation Proclamation, we understand that forever now in this country, No one can be held as a slave. The slaves were set free in in January 1st, 1863. But we also know that there was not the internet, there was not social media, there were no very fast ways to get information out. And so a lot of those who were in slavery did not realize that they were in fact free until uh, weeks, sometimes months. Uh, There were even stories of, of years later that people actually found out, these slaves found out that they were actually free. And the article wasn't about those two things. The article was actually about the slaves who heard this information, that there were some who heard the, the, the announcement that they were free. They heard that and they uh, left their places. And there are many amazing stories of many of these slaves who went on to do some incredible, unbelievable things in society, in our country, and are forever remembered as, as overcoming so much to achieve great things. But the article was actually about, and I never heard this, I never actually understood this, the article was about how many of those slaves that didn't leave. As a matter of fact, they stayed exactly where they were. They didn't go off to do anything new. They didn't go anywhere. They stayed and did exactly what they had been doing before. Now, the reasons that the article highlighted were were many. There were many reasons why. And today is not the time to figure out all those reasons. But when I read that article, and then I read this passage of Scripture, I thought, how true can that be for us also? That just like... Those slaves who had been given the news that they were free men and women, set free, emancipated, and yet many of them stayed where they were and continued to do what they were doing. No life changed. Nothing changed for them actually at all. In the same way, I think so many people who are followers of Jesus can get caught in either a season or a week or honestly they spend their entire lives having known the truth that the great emancipator Jesus has set them free and yet continue to live in their old ways of living. Continue to live in that, that old bondage to sin, that old lifestyle. They never broke free free from who they used to be. As a matter of fact, there's probably someone here this morning, as a matter of fact, multiple people who are, have been saved, have born again, you have been freed by Christ, but you still look exactly like you did the day you got saved. There is no change in your life. You still may even be still choosing the same sins that you were doing before Jesus came into your life. But there may be some who are like, no, 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 that's not me, dude. When Jesus set me free, man, I, I, I took out of there. I, I, man, he did a crazy work in my life. But 
you have found yourself over the last couple of days or weeks or maybe even seasons going back to that old lifestyle, going back to those old sins, those, those old things that made you feel comfortable or kind of filled that void for the moment. Those bottles, those screens, those, those choices, that gossip, that slander, that old person that you used to be, we, we sometimes go back to that bondage. And so if you're here this morning and either A, either one of those can describe you, that maybe you've never really truly taken hold of the freedom that Christ has given you, you're still in that old life, or you've gone back to that old life, you kind of dabbled back in that old sin that you used to deal with, that entangled you, that enslaved you, or that may not be you, but you and I understand, especially looking at the passage last week, which if you didn't see, I'd encourage you to go look at, you and I will always have a propensity, a, 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 a leading, a yearning, a temptation back to that old self. We will always have that push. I heard someone say one time, and it's very true, as a matter of fact, it was a preacher, and he said, Blake, I, I was in seminary at the time. And he said, don't you ever forget, this is an older preacher, an older man, and he said, don't ever forget that you are always one step from stupid. You are always, no matter how long you walk with Jesus, no matter how many sermons you preach, no matter how many things that you do for Christ, you are always one step from stupid. You may be at that place this morning where you haven't quite taken that step, but, but stupid has showed up in your life, in your heart, in your mind. And so what are we to do with that? How can we live as emancipated, as free in Christ? How can we take hold of that new life that Jesus has called us to live and not go back to that old life, not live that old way of living? Well, the truth, the answer to that question is found here in this passage of Scripture, and it's found in the beautiful and awesome reality of grace. And so I want us to dive into this passage. We're going to break it up and read just a few sections at a time, uh, beginning at verse 15, and we're going to read to verse 18 first. But I want to read this together with us. Paul writes to the church there, what then shall we, what then shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Remember, he finished last week's sermon by, hey, let's rejoice. We're no longer under the law. We're actually under grace. God has forgiven us. He set us free. And so then he poses a question. So now that we're under grace, why don't we just keep on sinning? We're going to get to that here in just a moment. He responds by saying, may it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. The first truth that we're going to see this morning, if you don't want to live in that old life, you and I have got to first realize the purpose of grace. Now, when I say grace, I want to, so they're all on the same page, we understand what we're talking about when we say grace. Remember, mercy is not receiving what we deserve from God. So what you and I deserve is hell, punishment, complete and total judgment from God. That's what we deserve. So God in his mercy through Christ does not give us what we deserve. That's mercy. But grace is different. Grace is actually God giving us his forgiveness and his righteousness even though we didn't earn it. So mercy is not getting what we do earn. Grace is receiving from God what we don't what we didn't earn, what we cannot work for, what we can't appease God for, that is grace. And grace is given to us through two major ways. One, God's forgiveness, that you and I, through Jesus, are forgiven for past, present, and future sins. But then also, grace is given to us in the sense that God gives us his righteousness. Meaning that when you get saved, God views you now as forgiven, and he views you now as righteous before him right standing before him okay so that's grace okay so now we've got to realize the purpose of that first so Paul starts off by saying hey look the purpose of grace is not for you and I to exploit it the purpose of grace is not to take advantage of what God has done for us matter of fact I had a conversation this morning this morning somebody came to me and said hey man I had a conversation with somebody and it just didn't go well and I was like well what happened they were like well you know I was talking to him and they were saying well I mean 
yeah, I've done this stuff, but God's going to forgive me anyway, so if I do it again, then, then okay, God's still going to forgive me. And they're like, I didn't know what to say with him, and I was like, it's ironic you're bringing that up to me, because that's exactly what we're talking about. That's what Paul's saying here. Well, if God's going to forgive us, here's what it looks like in our hearts. If God's going to forgive me, well, then why not just go ahead and do it? If God's going to forgive me, then, then let's go ahead. If, if I'm under grace now and not under law, if there's nothing that I can do that will cause God to not love me and, and to not give me grace, then man, let's go party. Let's go do whatever our flesh and the old life wants to do because we're under grace. We're forgiven. And Paul answers that question by saying, by no means is that the way to respond to grace. Like, may it never be, is Paul is ultimately saying. And he helps us understand something, that if you pre present yourselves as slaves for obedience, you're slaves to the one whom you obey. What Paul's wanting us to understand is the person or the thing that you say yes to is ultimately your master, is your master. And so what he's saying is, even though you may be saved, if you keep saying yes to sin, you keep saying yes to that old life, you're ultimately going to become what you used to be at the beginning, a slave to who you're saying yes to. Think about it like this. Think about the first time that you did a certain sin, a sin that really tangles you up. Maybe you can remember it, maybe you can't. But for some people, maybe they can't. Imagine that first time that you said yes to it, like there was this, there was this build up, there was this difficulty, there was like, ah, I don't know if I should do that, I don't know if I should take, I don't know if I should uh, take this plunge, but you finally do, and it was like, oh my gracious, and you like revert back, like, ah, I shouldn't have done that, what was I thinking, how could I have done that? But then when you go back to it, again and again and again and again, whatever that sin is, it becomes a lot easier. Matter of fact, it actually becomes a habit. It becomes something that you think you need, something that has got a, a crutch to get you through life because you can't live without it anymore. What has happened? That you and I actually, in those moments, we've actually become a slave to this. Notice what Paul's wanting us to understand. He was like, look, don't keep going back to your old sin because God has forgiven you. That's, that's messing up the whole process. That's not what grace was intended for us. Matter of fact, I want to give us the purpose of grace here. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. But the purpose of grace is to enjoy God, not exploit God. The purpose of grace is to enjoy God and say yes to righteousness, but not to exploit God. You know, exploiting means this idea of taking advantage of or, or taking something from something for your own benefit. You know, like you, maybe you've seen before these different places that uh, maybe it's, it's a, a place that they have certain... Uh, rocks, or they think that there's oil there, they think that there's some natural resource that they can get from there. So in certain places, if there's certain metals there, they will drill down and create this big crater, right? These quarries that they'll create. And they'll just strip the land of everything it's got until it has no more of whatever they're looking for. And then once they do, what happens? They leave it. There's no more benefit to them. They've gotten what they want from that thing, and now they're moving on to something else. That is exploiting. That is taking something, or sometimes someone, taking everything that you want from them, and then once you've gotten everything from them that you want, you leave them. That's exploiting. And I think sometimes we treat God that way. Instead of treating God's grace as something to enjoy and to be a motivation for us to obey Him, we actually go to Him and say, hey, I want your forgiveness, I want your blessing, and I want heaven, I want that stuff, but I don't want anything else. I, I don't want your obedience. I don't want to like, have to sacrifice anything. I don't, I don't want to have to read your word or follow you or be in obedience. You're like, I don't want that. I want forgiveness. I want heaven. And I want, all, I, I want you to bless me. That's it. That's all I want. Well, that is exploiting God. And I'm going to go over here to my old life, my old sins, and keep doing these, but wanting your forgiveness and heaven and your blessing. Listen, we've got to realize the purpose of grace. The purpose of grace is for us to enjoy God, not exploit God. Here's the difference. <clears throat> Let me give you two scenes, two scenarios, two different types of people. I want you to imagine for a second, you go back in time with me to my wedding. Back, uh, uh, um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> go back to my wedding with me, okay? <clears throat> July 12th, 2008, I know when I got married, 
But go back there with me. You aren't there. None of you are there. Uh, but go back with me. And imagine in that moment there, where Joy and I are standing there in front of each other. We're so excited and we talk to each other right before the wedding ceremony. Before everything starts, we, we had the, the reveal before, so we took the pictures before. And um, so imagine that her and I are standing there talking, tux, white dress, which by the way, just for, just for laughs, my tux, for like two months, it was popular to have brown tuxes. And so your boy got brown tuxes for everybody in his wedding party. So when they look back, it's like, oh, wow, you look like a bunch of sticks standing there. And so anyway, not a good idea. Anyway, so brown tux, white dress, we're standing there. And imagine Joy looks at me in that moment and says, Blake, I'm so excited. I, I cannot wait to spend the rest of my life with you. I'm so excited to think about our future children and where God's going to take us. And I, there's nothing in me that has any reservation about spending the rest of my life with you. Oh, that's sweet. Now, imagine I turn around, and I look at her, and I say, um, okay, well, I just need to be clear on the front end with you, okay? I am only doing this right now. I'm only engaging in this moment because I want a tax credit this year and for the rest of my life. Like, there, there, there's no other reason that I'm doing this. So all that stuff about spending our life together and children and all those things, like, I, I don't want that. All I want is a tax credit. You go do you. I'll do me. You go, and, and, and this will be fine. So, so are you good now still going and getting married? Well, if that were my true heart in that moment, like, Joy would be like, uh, I don't understand tax credits, but no, I don't think so. That doesn't sound, that doesn't sound like something I, that you're motivated by is good enough to spend the rest of your life with somebody. And we get that. Like, nobody would do that. Nobody's walking into marriage and just like, yeah, I don't, I don't care anything about you. I just want tax credit. But here's why I tell that story. It's because I think that sometimes that's how we treat God. God is there saying, I want to spend my life with you. I gave my son for you, and I want to spend eternal life with you. I want you to be in my family. Matter of fact, Jesus even uses that language of a bride and a groom to describe him and his church. Like, that's the relationship he talks about, that he cares. He's so concerned about his bride. And that's how God, that's what God says to us. But I think sometimes we say to God, yeah, 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 <laughs> I, I, I don't want that. Your grace and everything is great for my forgiveness, but I don't want anything else. I don't want to have to obey you. I don't want to have to like, like spend time with you and your word or like I have to sacrifice anything to like follow you. Like I'm, I'm good. I don't want that. I just want a tax credit. Matter of fact, I want an eternal tax credit. I want to be forgiven and that's it. And what Paul's saying here is like, guys, that's not the purpose of grace. The purpose of grace is to enjoy God, not to exploit God. Okay, so the second truth about grace is that not only do we need to realize the purpose of grace, but we also need to reach for the goal of grace. So there is a reason for God's grace. There's many reasons, but Paul lays out one big one for us here. So join back with me in verse 19 as we look at the goal of grace. So he says, I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. That is a biblical way of kind of making fun of them a little bit. Uh, for just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were freed in regards to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now having been freed from sin... And enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification, and then here's the outcome, eternal life. So Paul starts off this next section by saying, okay, okay, I'm going to put this very simply for all of us listening, okay? I'm going to put this in human terms so that you understand. And he goes on to say, you used to, in your old way of life, you would bring to the table your whole self for sin. So you would present yourselves to sin. In our, in our days, it would be like you, you came to your laptop, or you came to your phone, or you came to this bar, or this situation, you, you came to this, you, you presented yourself to this opportunity of sin, and the result of that is more sin. So the more you brought yourself to that, the more you actually became a slave to sin. Pastor Archie says this often, that, and I'll probably get this wrong, but I think I'm going to get it close, but sin will take you further than you want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay, 
and bring more damage into your life than you ever thought possible. That that's what sin does. As a matter of fact, that's what Paul is saying. He's like, hey, listen, this just resulted in more sin. See, that's what sin does. That's how you know if something's sinful or not. That the more you do it, the more hungry you are for it and the more empty you are. So sin is deceitful. It's like once you partake of it, it's like, oh, okay, that was good in the moment. But then here's what happens. Guilt rushes in and then a big void comes in. So like, oh man, I feel bad. So what I need to do, I need to do that more again to get that feeling. But as you continue to do that thing, whatever it is, the gap in your heart of void continues to get wider because you realize there's no hope in it. There's no purpose in it except for going back to it. So what Paul is describing is us being slaves to that type of behavior, to those old things. But he said, hey, here's the deal. The same way that worked is the same way that it works on the opposite end. That when you and I present ourselves to God, when you and I come to his word in the mornings, open his word and seek him through prayer, when we come to church here, when we gather as a church, when we do the things that God has called us to do, well, that actually snowballs as well. But it doesn't snowball snowball where the void gets wider. It actually snowballs in the opposite way, where we feel more full, more complete, more full of joy. Jesus actually says, hey, I came to give you life and life to the fullest. But he pitted that against what the enemy came for. The enemy came to steal, to kill, and destroy. So what he's saying is, you choose the enemy, and all you're going to feel is being stolen from, killed, and destroyed. But when you come to me, I'm going to give you life and life to the fullest. And so what Paul is ultimately saying is, that who are you going to pick here? Who are you going to be a slave to? Because when we choose God... The result is, an interesting word here that we don't use often, sanctification. What is that? What is sanctification? Well, it's a really unique process of you and God joining together for you to become more like Jesus. So every time you open your eyes, walk to a place, grab your coffee and your Bible and you sit down, well, God starts working. The sanctification process starts working. Every time you show up here, and you're not showing up just to fill a seat, and you're wanting to go somewhere else, but you're showing up here, and your eyes and your ears are open, your heart is open to what God has to say to you this morning. Well, you have come through these doors in prayer, having spent a little bit of time before you walked here praying, God, show me what I need to hear today. Well, then that continues to that process of sanctification. The process of sanctification is God making you more like Jesus, and you have a part to play in that not all God it depends on what which team you decide that day you're going to be a part of which team in in a certain moment that you decide and every time you choose obedience God shows up and he starts working in your life the process of sanctification making you more like Jesus doesn't mean you're loved less it means that he works more I want to I want to show you I have it in your notes there but you have like the acronym down lose right there that's a really a really simple way for me to sum up this section right there L O S E right there in your outline and we got it there on the screen and so I thought that was a really good way to summarize this paragraph but also to summarize our entire lives so the first part the first step in us living the life that God's called us to live after we've been saved is to number one realize every day that you're loved realize every day that you're loved. Listen, I want to share this with every person here. I've shared it often. It's something I have to remind myself of every single day because here's what's crazy. Every day I forget it. And not that I forget God loves me, but every day I wake up and I'm bombarded with everything else I have going on. All the problems, all the stresses, and most of mine are like Christian related. So they seem in my head like I should be thinking about those church related. In reality, my first priority is not to my family. It's not to this church. My first priority is to Jesus. And so I have to remind myself of this truth. There is nothing that you and I can do to make God love us more. And there's nothing that you have done to make God love you less. The first step in obedience is not you pulling up your bootstraps and just getting it for God. The first step of obedience is you realizing that you are eternally, unconditionally, and completely loved by Christ. That all of your sins have been forgiven by Jesus on the cross. That your death has been destroyed in his resurrection. The first step in you living the life that God's called you to live, a life free from that old life, is realizing your love. The second step is obedience. Verse 22 actually outlines this. He says literally, 
But now you've been set freed from sin, loved, enslaved to God. So now he's saying, hey, you now have a choice, now that you're free, as to who you're going to serve. And when you choose obedience, when you choose God in a moment or in a day, you, you choose obedience. God, I'm going to pray for this person. God, I'm going to share the gospel with this person. God, I'm going to give this week. God, I'm going to, to spend time in your word every day this week. I'm going to seek you, God. I'm going to say yes to a group. God, I'm going to say yes to whatever you're calling me to. It may be something huge. God may be calling some of you to ministry, some of you to the mission field. It's you saying yes to God. Obedience. The third step then is when you and I choose obedience, God shows up and starts sanctifying us. He starts showing up and making us more like Jesus. Here's what's cool about it. The more you say yes to Jesus, the more you begin to look like him. I'm going to say that again because that's, that's so simple. And that's what he's saying. The more you say yes to Jesus, the more you, are, the more you begin to look like him. Sanctification is a two-way street. It's our choices and God's work intermingling with each other to make us more like Jesus. We have to show up. We have to show up in the process of sanctification. And then the last is eternal life. It says, hey, so you're enslaved to God, and there's benefit there with that, resulting in sanctification, and ultimately the outcome is eternal life. What he's saying here is this, <clears throat> twofold. One is that when we are becoming more like Jesus, we are reminded that, oh yeah, oh, this is crazy new perspective of like eternal life has started the day he got saved. Did you know that? That your eternal life started, matter of fact, the eternal life started when you were born. Everybody is going to spend eternity somewhere. It's not like this new thing that happens after you get saved. And it's like, sweet, I got eternal life. No, 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 my friends. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. For some of you, that's a very sobering thought. For some of you this morning, you may be like, well, I don't know where I'm going. Or I know exactly where I'm going. And it's not where some of these people are going. It's not what Paul's talking about. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. What Paul's saying is not just eternal life generally. What Paul's saying is for these Christians, Eternal life in heaven with Christ. We forget that sometimes. We kind of lose perspective. We get our eyes so focused here that we miss what's coming there. And what Paul is wanting us to understand is like, hey, you, feel, you know that you're loved, and so you obey. And as you obey, God continues to make you more like Jesus until ultimately you go to be with Jesus. This is this marination process, life. Life is this crazy marination process of us becoming more like Jesus accomplishing what he's called us to until we get to be with Jesus forever. Crazy thought for us to let sink in that heaven's coming for those of us who are saved, but also for those who aren't, hell is coming also. Eternal life is coming for every person. You know, in high school sports, there's this thing called the signing day. Whether it's football or basketball or baseball, every, every sport and, and, and many schools around our region, and a matter of fact, all over the country, have signing day, where high school athletes declare where they are going to go to college and what sport they're going to play. So literally in almost every sport, there is kind of a, a signing day for athletes. And if a school doesn't put it on, maybe a parent will. But you all have seen it. You know what I'm talking about with a signing day? You know, raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. A little signing day. There are more at 930, so I, I'm, just, I'm not competing. I'm just saying. Um, so a signing day is very simple. So... Typically what happens is there's a table and the young athlete is sitting there sometimes beside his coach or her coach or sometimes beside their parents or maybe all of them are back there with like their friends and teammates and there's typically a couple of hats in front of them. You know, there's a couple of different schools kind of represented by a hat or some other uh, paraphernalia from that school. So what a young man or young woman will do is to declare what school they're going to, to declare where they are committing their next four years, or six or seven, some, um, is they will grab, that was a joke, okay? Um, they will take a hat and put it on their head. Now, sometimes they'll kind of joke with you and grab one hat and be like, oh, I'm just kidding, and they'll grab one at the last minute and put it on. But once they put that hat on their head, what they are declaring is, I am going to Arkansas. I'm going to Arkansas State. I'm going to Alabama. I'm going to Notre Dame. Whatever their university is, they're saying, that's where I'm committing. That is where I'm going. This is the direction of the next four years of my life. Now, why do I tell that story? Because as I was looking at this passage of scripture and thinking about love and obedience and sanctification, and eternal life, I thought, there's no better way to think about that, what Paul's saying by signing day. That when you and I wake up every morning, we're sitting at the table and, and God is saying, who are you going to serve today? 
Who are you going to commit? What hat are you going to put on today? Because there's two hats in front of us. There's flesh, me, where I do what I want to do. I pursue what I want to pursue. I sin the way I want to sin. Or there's Christ. And every day, you and I have the option as saved people. Now, if you're not saved, you don't have an option. You've got the hat of flesh on you all the time. Okay, You haven't been born again. It's just flesh all the time. But if you are saved, you have the option, what Paul's saying here, is you can put on the hat of flesh, or you can put on the hat of faith. You can put on the hat of sin, or you can put on the hat of Christ. Which hat did you put on this morning? What hat did you put on this last week? What hat, in the first hours of your day, have you put on this last month? What hat are you wearing right now? Now, for those of you who are here, I mean, you, you're saying, hey, I, I'm in. Well, maybe it looks like that physically. What about your heart? What about your heart? Because ultimately, you're not just putting on a hat. What you're ultimately saying is, this is who my heart is going to serve. Look, Paul even says that there in that first part of that. From the heart. Maybe a better question to ask before we dive into this last truth is, whose hat is on your heart? The crazy thing is, the great thing is, every morning if you're truly saved, every morning you can wake up and decide whose hat you're going to put on your heart. Whose allegiance, whose surrender, whose are you going to commit to? So here's the last truth this morning. That if you and I, remember, here's the thing. If we no longer want to live in that old way of living, then we first, we have to realize the purpose of God's grace in our life. That it is meant to enjoy God, not exploit God. The second thing is that we have to reach for the goal of grace. That there's a goal that God has presented in front of us of grace. And the goal is to choose Christ over yourself. Over righteousness, over sin. But here's the last truth. That we also have to rejoice in the gift of of grace. Rejoice in the gift of grace. I want to invite Trey back up as we bring all this together this morning. That you and I have to rejoice in the gift of grace. I wanted to point our attention to one last verse, just one verse, very familiar verse for many of you. For the wages of sin, Paul writes, is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So here's what Paul is doing. Look at the contrast he makes here. He first says, okay, for the wages of sin is death. So let me unpack that word wage for a moment. Many of you have jobs. Maybe you are retired or maybe you're not quite old enough to can I have a steady job. But for those of you who do or those of you who can understand what I'm talking about, a wage is something that you have earned from an employer because of the time and or the work that you've put into your job. So many of you got paid this last week, or you got paid, you know, last week, or you get paid once a month, whatever, but that is your wage. So you put in work, and then your employer gives back to you your wage. This is what you've earned for your time and your work. This is what you have been, this is what you deserve. So what Paul is saying here is that you and I have a wage before God. That from the moment we're born, we start an account with God. As he, the grand employer with a capital E, and us, the the created servant. And that is not this like, oh, you're putting in good over here, putting in bad over here, putting in bad over here, putting in good over here. What he's saying is, you and I, because we are sinners, the wage for our sin is death. So the more that you and I live, matter of fact, the bigger that retirement account gets. And one day, that retirement account that we keep putting into is ultimately going to cash out. That we're ultimately going to have to receive what we have been investing in. But the cash out for the investment of sin is ultimately what Paul says, death. A physical death, a physical death that all of us one day are going to die. That's the reality, that's the truth. We will all be replaced one day. But it's also a spiritual death. It's a separation from God, an eternal separation from God. No matter, I know some people say, like, well, I've done some good things too. Listen, it doesn't matter. 
Before, before you give your life to Jesus, all you are accumulating before God is sin leading to death. And one day, God's going to cash that out for you. One day, you are going to have to take a withdrawal from that account. So he's pairing that with something very different. The difference is what he says here. But there is a free gift. So you've got building up these wages over here, but there's another alternative. And the other alternative is God's free gift to you. That you don't, you don't earn it, you can't work towards it, you can't do enough good stuff to get it. No, it's a free gift. 100% completely and totally unsolicited free. And it's not only free, but it is a gift. It's something that you want. It's something that you and I are longing for and desiring. And what is it? It is eternal life, he says. Eternal life that starts the moment we say yes to Jesus. Life to the fullest. That's what we're looking for, searching for, longing for. It's eternal life. And we don't get it because we go to church. We don't get it because we're good. We get it because of who? Jesus Christ. That Jesus, yeah, we can celebrate that. That Jesus on the cross died for our sins. He was buried and he resurrected from the grave. And then he extends his nail-pierced hands from heaven and said, I got a free gift for you. Yeah, I've got a free gift. Believe in me. Repent of your sins. Come to me and I will give you this gift. You don't have to cash in that death. Matter of fact, death, on this side, death is the best thing that will happen to us. Do you know that Jesus sometimes, I, I've noticed this, I didn't say this at the last service, but so often we pray for people to be healed and we pray for people to get better and rightly so, we should. We should, okay? But do you know what Jesus prayed in John 17? Go look it up. Go look up John 17 and how Jesus prayed. He prayed about his disciples, and then he prayed about the ones that weren't yet with him. He was praying for us, the church, 2,000 years after that moment. But here's what he prayed. Ultimately, what he's saying, go back and read it. John 17, he says, God, I want to be with them. I want to be with them. Sometimes when we pray for people to be healed and for them to not die, sometimes we're praying against Christ. That Christ wants them home with Him. Listen, if you know Jesus, your death will be the best day of your life. It may be the most painful at the front end, but it will be the most amazing on the back end. Our death is nothing to fear. Our death is nothing to be afraid of. Because Jesus has already overcome death. So we are to rejoice in the gift of grace every day. That's how you get out of that old lifestyle. You realize that you've been set free. You don't have those wages of sin that's leading to death. You have the free gift of God through Christ. Let me share with you a story as we bring all this together this morning. About a man who received the grace of God and it changed his life. A young man's name was John. John was seven years old when his mom died. And uh, he was pretty tore up about it just like any other seven year old would be. And when his mom passed away, um, his dad, who was a, a sea captain, this was back in the 1700s, by the way, his dad was a very rough individual, he was a drunk, he was tough, he was, I mean, just foul-mouthed, I mean, everything you could imagine of a 1700s sailor, like, that's what his dad was. So mom wasn't around anymore, so the boy, John, went to be with his dad and learned his dad's ways. His dad discipled him in the ways of drunkenness and womanizing and, and just just this hellish lifestyle that his dad was living in. He was teaching his son, and John came up and did exactly what his dad taught him to do. And not only was his dad a seaman, his dad was a slave trader. He plucked people off the continent of Africa and took them to England to sell them. And so that's what John started doing. And John was really good at it. John made a lot of money, he and his dad did, selling people for money. And one night, there was this great storm, a storm that even scared a, 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 a very um, weathered seaman. And he thought John and all the people on the boat were going to die. And so in that moment, down in the hull of the ship, this trembling young 20-year-old, he cries out to Jesus. And he begs for Jesus to save him, believing that that was going to be his last hour. And he, he didn't want to go to hell. He didn't want to spend his life or eternal life away from Christ and so and that last moment that last ditch effort 
He prays and asks Jesus to save him. And what's crazy is Jesus saves him, not only, but also rescues the boat. 